America is reopening. Tests over the death of George Floyd while in police. People are taking to the streets. Protests could cause a spike in coronavirus. Amid fears of a second wave, correspondent Martin Smith looks at how we got here. Anybody that needs a test gets a test. We Did you say to him, look, Mr. President, with all due respect, it's not true what you're saying. Yeah, I'm not going to comment on the conversations I've had with the president. The missteps and the denials. This is their new hope. We have leaders throughout much of January and February saying that this is a hoax. Every lab is fighting for itself. Every state is fighting for itself. Now on Frontline, the virus. There will be thousands who will die needlessly because of our lack of preparedness. December 31st. One million people crowded into New York's Times Square to celebrate what they hoped would be a bright new year. What no one knew at the time was that a highly infectious virus was rapidly moving toward them. related to SARS may be responsible for a mysterious pneumonia outbreak in China. I had begun reporting on the coronavirus several months ago. The new coronavirus was found in 15 of 59 patients. I had just returned from the Middle East where I was covering events in Iraq and Iran. Out of caution, I decided to quarantine in the Catskill Mountains, two hours north of New York City. I would do my reporting from here. As it stands right now, the CDC believes that the risk to the American population is low, but we just don't know how contagious this virus is. I wanted to understand where we were headed. Were we prepared? Were warnings being heeded? Among my first calls was to Dr. David Ho. Dr. Ho. A renowned American Hi. medical how researcher who I met years back when I was reporting on the AIDS epidemic. You don't look too worse for wear. <laughs> I'm just putting up a good front here. <laughs> Dr. Ho had worked to stem the spread of SARS in 2003. Now he was worried about the spread of COVID-19. Do you think people are grasping how, how serious this situation is? I, I think people hear the news, they watch the coverage, but it's hard to fully comprehend. Certainly, we did not realize that our government would be uh, so ill-prepared. We knew long ago what China was experiencing. I think it, the, there was the false assumption that that's somebody else's problem. It would not happen to us. But that, that's the same kind of attitude that people had about many other epidemics in the past. We, we knew if this thing blew up, it would just continue to spread. Wuhan, a major commercial hub in central China. The first case was identified here on November 17th. No one knew what it was, but just a few weeks later, it was clear something was wrong. Amy Chin reported from China for the New York Times. In December, there were starting to be these patients that were trickling into these hospitals in Wuhan with this pneumonia that doctors were really puzzled by. It was unclear how to treat them. They were giving them medicine and they weren't getting better and they were still running these very high temperatures. And the rumor was that this is a virus that people need to be aware of. Throughout December, more and more people continued to come into Wuhan hospitals with high fevers and coughs. Then on December 30th, a 34-year-old ophthalmologist at Wuhan Central Hospital, Dr. Li Wenliang, logged on to a group chat with some fellow medical school classmates. 
he was worried. Have you seen the record of what was said, what he was saying? Yes, it really wasn't that outrageous statement he made or anything, just simply said that I heard in our hospital there are cases of um, SARS-like symptoms. Liu Baifang Shell and her husband Orville are longtime China experts. And that was enough to bring the authorities down on him? Yes. Public Security Bureau came and made him sign a confession and made him agree to, 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 to be quiet. And that's a very threatening thing because the Public Security Bureau is no joke. It's a secret police force and people are, are fearful of it. In China, there's an entire system of online surveillance in which they can monitor what's happening. And I think in this case, they would have been able to use certain keywords to track what people were saying. And actually, local authorities, the police, have broad powers to look into the personal messages of its citizens. Local Wuhan authorities issued a formal directive ordering other doctors not to discuss the mysterious pneumonia. Despite the silencing of dissent, Chinese scientists were working to map the genome of the virus. COVID-19 was very quickly sequenced and very quickly people discerned that was about 80% related to the SARS coronavirus. But given the sub speed of the subsequent spread, it should have been apparent to all that there must have been human to human transmission. It surprises me to see that as of January 12th, the World Health Organization issued a statement saying there is no clear evidence of human to human transmission. They certainly said that, but you know, they weren't on the ground. They were probably recounting what was reported back to them by the China CDC. Shouldn't they have known? Well, they should have been asking tough questions. This was obviously an uh, epidemic that was being spread by humans. <laughs> But with Lunar New Year around the corner, no one wanted to spoil the festivities. Chinese New Year every year is a really festive time. This is the time when everyone gets together with their families and in their neighborhoods. And in one neighborhood in Wuhan called Bai Buting, they had organized this large banquet at which 40,000 families ended up attending. If you have a big celebration, you don't want to have bad news. And same holds for the Chinese uh, New Year. If you bring up bad news during that time period, it is said that you'll be cursed uh, with bad happenings for the rest of the year. Making matters worse, millions of people left Wuhan in this period to visit friends and family across the country and beyond. It was not until January 20th that the Chinese health ministry declared what was already obvious. The virus was spreading from human to human. Some ominous developments out of China. Officials there have just confirmed the first human to human transmission of coronavirus. It's a huge story. The WHO did not announce the prospect of human to human transmission almost two months after this thing began. And it was two weeks after uh, Taiwan had warned them that there was a human to human transmission. Wuhan, China, ground zero for the outbreak now under lockdown. Most By January 23rd, Wuhan was placed on lockdown. All trains and planes out of that city halted just tonight. Eerie for a city 11 million people call home. It was then that people around the world began to take notice. 
I perfectly remember the moment in which we start fearing this issue. And it was when we have seen all those Caterpillar building a new hospital in just less than 10 days. Dr. Stefano Fagioli heads the Department of Medicine at a hospital in Bergamo, Italy. It's in a place far away from us, uh, so it was all TV show. But then uh, I remember I was having a meeting with, uh, with some colleagues and I said, look, but if they are building a, a whole hospital, uh, there must be something beyond our perception. And I said, I think we need to be prepared. Two new coronavirus cases have been confirmed here in Singapore. In fact, by early February, cases began showing up in other countries, including the U.S. The deadly coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. A ninth person has tested positive for coronavirus. This is now the third case in Ontario, fourth case in Canada. And it really shows just how fluid this situation is. Meanwhile, Dr. Li Wenliang, the Wuhan doctor who had warned of the deadly virus at the end of December, had been hospitalized, a little over a week after he was ordered to stay quiet. By late January, he was on a ventilator, struggling to breathe. By February 7th, he was dead. His death was really a shock. And at that time, that was the lowest point in China's battle with the epidemic. And his death really put a human face on the cost of it. When news of Dr. Li's death surfaced, Chinese social media exploded in outrage. He, he told people the truth at the end of December. It got the attention of Dr. Zhong Nan Shan, an 83-year-old, highly respected pulmonologist, a top advisor to the government. And then he passed away. He now dared to defy the party. I, I think the majority of the people think he's, he's the hero of China, China. That seemed unusual to me, to hear somebody that is an authority like that to criticize uh, the government. Well, Dr. Zhong Nanshan, I mean, the reason why he has so much credibility with the public is because he's willing to push back against the government, criticize the government when it's necessary. I think he was speaking, just saying what most people in China feel. This is Chinese doctor. I suppose majority of Chinese doctor actually like him. And in Wuhan and some other cities, they held a short morning memory. Everyone would go out onto their balconies and turn the lights off and hold their cell phones up. It was really incredible to see. A month earlier, the Trumps greeted the new year in Florida. They hosted a big party at their Mar-a-Lago mansion. Tonight, a new year and an impeachment trial looming. Family members honor guests and hundreds of members of President Trump's private club. Our country has never done better than it's doing right now. We have the best unemployment numbers. We have the best employment numbers. Almost 160 million people are working. And our country is really the talk of the world. Everybody's talking about it. Thank you. But that weekend, the director of the Centers for Disease Control, Dr. Robert Redfield, received a phone call from the American CDC office in China. I was actually on a vacation with my children, their spouses, and my 11 grandchildren up in Deep Creek, Maryland. And I did get notified from our CDC China office on New Year's Eve that there was a cluster of cases of uh, unspecified pneumonia in Wuhan, China, that seemed to be linked to a seafood market. 
The call was one of several that interrupted his vacation. And if you talk to my wife, she said, I spent most of the time on the phone um, talking to... On January 3rd, Redfield called his Chinese counterpart, Dr. George Gao. It got to the point that the Redfield's counterpart even breaks down crying during one of the conversations that he has with him. Michael Shear is a White House correspondent for the New York Times. Uh, which underscores for, for Redfield the seriousness of what the Chinese believe at that point that they're dealing with. The memory of those previous viral infections, SARS and another one called MERS, that they really ravaged that part of the world. So I think what you can what you can probably draw from it is a is a bit of the anxiety on the part of the doctor sitting there in China. Uh, thinking to himself, geez, if, what if this is as bad as SARS? What if it's worse? Shear stands by his reporting, but Redfield told me that Gao was not very alarmed. He felt pretty confident that there was no evidence of human-to-human -human transmission, and that really was the extent of it. So he wasn't very concerned. If there was no human-to-human -human transmission confirmed, then he wasn't very concerned at that point? Back in January 3rd time frame, 3rd through 6th time frame, um, there was not a sense of urgency from him. But Redfield was concerned and called his boss, Alex Azar, Secretary of Health and Human Services. He also notified the National Security Council at the White House. The president had already begun receiving daily briefings from the U.S. intelligence community. Some contained warnings of a serious contagion with dire economic and social consequences. They call it the PDB, the President's Daily Briefing, and the virus begins to pop up in those, just a sort of, hey, you know, this could be something and we should keep an eye on it. You say it's in his brief. We know that he doesn't always read his brief. Right. Um, so what do we know about when did the President know? That's a good question about whether or not he might have actually read it. He's never been clear uh, any of the times that he's been asked. And I think our reporting suggests that, um, as you say, it's, it's not clear at all that he reads the briefing. And the president now says he was distracted. I mean, I got impeached. I think, you know, I certainly devoted a little time to thinking about it, right? And busy securing a big trade deal with China. A rare moment of collaboration after more than two years of acrimonious talks. During this period, Azar was trying to alert the president, but couldn't get a meeting. Instead, over two weeks passed before he got a call back from Mar-a-Lago on a Saturday. And the president wanted to discuss something else. The president was not reached by Secretary Azar until January 18th. And the president's first concern at that time was to talk about e-cigarettes. Stephen Morrison is a health policy expert who has long warned that America was unprepared for a pandemic like this one. And Secretary Azar was having a hard time conveying the gravity of the situation to the president. This is 18 days after the Chinese government has recognized that they are seeing deaths from this, and it takes 18 days for Azar to get to the president. Correct. Was that the president's first true briefing on this? As far as I know, it was the first serious high-level discussion. But it is unclear how much Azar pressed the president. He declined to be interviewed. According to Michael Scheer, Azar actually reassured the president that he didn't need to worry. What Azar wanted to communicate to the president was, we got this, we're not, we're not taking this lightly. CDC is on it, FDA is on it. We're monitoring it closely, but also not like we all have to panic and shut the country down. I mean, at this point, it's, it's really everybody is in the mode of, you know, this, we got to keep an eye on this. Are the words about a pandemic at this point? No, we're not at all, and we have it under control. It's uh, going to be just fine. As late as January 26th, Dr. Anthony Fauci, the nation's top infectious disease official, downplayed the dangers. The American people should not be worried or frightened by this. It's a very, very low risk to the United States because we have ways of preparing, of screening, of people coming in. But it's something that we as public health officials need to take very seriously. A prominent biostatistician, Nicholas Jewell, had been tracking the virus for over a month. 
There was still a remarkable lack of urgency in the Western world, that this was actually almost inevitably going to reach their shores and that it was going to be uh, potentially catastrophic unless we took major steps. So there's no question in my mind that we lost the time that we had gained from the early warning coming out of uh, China. On January 29th, White House economic advisor Peter Navarro sent the president a lengthy memo warning that there was a risk of massive loss of life. He urged flights from China to be halted. The next day, Secretary Azar had a second call with the president. This time, he was more concerned. He warned the president that the coronavirus might become a serious pandemic. The virus has been spread rapidly over the last month. The president responded by restricting some flights from China, but not all and millions of people had already left Wuhan anyway. And many of those people were flying out to the rest of the world. Yes. In fact, there are direct flights from Wuhan to many cities in the U.S. And that was happening throughout the month of uh, January until the lockdown. So those are extremely important weeks. Yes. In fact, in the month before President Trump's decision to restrict flights, an estimated 380,000 people entered the U.S. from China. Even afterwards, if you were an American, you were exempted, and flights from Europe were not restricted for another six weeks. Furthermore, asymptomatic carriers were not detected. One of the things that they didn't know at the time was, even if a person isn't symptomatic, doesn't have a fever, maybe that person is still spreading the virus all over the place because they have it and they're just not showing symptoms yet. The virus could spread undetected. Restricting flights proved to be a half measure. Those of us uh, who study viruses knew that we're going to be hit in waves. Here in the U.S., we have lost six weeks sitting on the sideline watching China struggle and watching other countries struggle, uh, thinking that if we shut our borders, uh, we'll, we'll be fine. Jeremy Konindyk, a specialist in global health issues, remembers meeting with some Trump administration officials around this time. In um, February, you sat down with some administration officials. Correct? So it was an off-the-record dinner, so I can't say too much specifically about it. But it was very clear that most of the bandwidth of the administration was focused on uh, enforcing the, the travel restrictions on China, tracking people who had come back from there, quarantining people. That was the, the ball that they had their eye on at that time. What's wrong with that? Well, what, I, was, I was quite gobsmacked by that because, to my mind, the biggest priority at that point was not preventing it from coming here because it was inevitable that it would come here. You know, it, it's it's fine to try and keep it out, but you have to do so with the expectation that the, at best you are buying time. The problem was that the administration was failing to understand the basic math behind a pandemic. If I tell you there's 30 cases in the United States, that's not going to scare you. That's not going to cause you to shut down your cities. If I tell you there's 60 cases in the United States, you still feel very comfortable. 120, 240, and so on. You don't feel the power of exponential growth until it's absolutely stunning. So when you say, oh, if there are 10,000 cases in the United States, then we ought to pay attention. The trouble is, in two or three days now, it's 20,000. Within another two or three days, it's 16 times. So it takes a long time to ramp up exponential growth. But once it gets your attention, it's stunning in its speed. In New York City, an infectious disease specialist with New York Presbyterian Hospital started to see cases he suspected of being COVID-19 by mid-February. We started to hear that there were a lot of viral illnesses that we were not able to identify. I started hearing conversations, suggestions from a lot of the community doctors in our area that maybe we were seeing early spread here. 
During this time, the president is saying everything's under control. People that want to get a test can get a test, that this is going to disappear when the weather warms up. How did you take that in at the time? You know, it was tough because, you know, as clinicians, when you get the sense something is going on, you're waiting for the ability to confirm that. But most of the response was, you know what, until we see a large number of cases, we don't want to over respond. We don't want to be, you know, the boy who cried wolf. In fact, there were people who thought you were a little bit uh, out there. They said, what's wrong with Dr. Griffin? Well, that, that, was, uh, that was actually when I reached out to one of the um, other infectious disease um, physicians in the area. And I said, hey, we really should start communicating and preparing. Um, and yeah, his response to one of my partners was, what's wrong with Dr. Griffin? Um, why, why is he like getting so worked up about this? Dr. Griffin was not alone. Many doctors and scientists were increasingly concerned that America was not prepared. Among the first countries outside China to face the coronavirus was South Korea. Their response is now a case study in how to handle an outbreak. Back in 2015, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, had scared them. I spoke to South Korea's foreign minister, Kang Kong Ha. The lessons from the mayor's experience uh, was, uh, was instrumental. I think that failure had the seeds for the success this time. Officials called an emergency meeting. With just four known cases of COVID-19 in the whole country, healthcare officials summoned 20 private companies on January 27th to a conference room inside Seoul's central train station. The train station in Seoul is not just a train station. It's a multi-function complex. And so if you want to bring in experts from all across the country and have a quick meeting, this would be the ideal place. The meeting at Seoul station was prepared and carried out by the Korean CDC. Dr. Lee Hyokmin was at the meeting and headed the initiative. The purpose of the meeting was to encourage the development of commercialized diagnostic kits for COVID-19. The meeting was somewhat tense. The meeting, the meeting was tense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was tense because no one knew how contagious the virus was and how much time they had. In our estimation, the chance of the importation of COVID-19 Korea is very high, we thought. Yeah. So, uh, when the first patient was confirmed in Korea, my first action is to, to make the diagnostic testing method to detect the COVID-19. Based on their experience with MERS, the number of infected people could be doubling every few days. In a matter of weeks, South Korea could be looking at over 100,000 cases. Moving fast, just days after the train station meeting, four companies had developed COVID tests. Just over a week later, one was approved for use. By February 7th, 46 labs across the country began to test people. A process that ordinarily could take a year had been completed in just over a week. There were only four cases when they had their meeting and, and call to action. That's right. And, you know, they recognized how dangerous this was. And even if all you have are four cases, that is a dangerous moment. They tested around 10,000 people daily. They then swung into action very decisively and set up this enormous testing regime along with a very robust tools for monitoring cases and tracing contacts and isolating and quarantining people based on that. They began acting before it seemed like they needed to do so. Former head of USAID, Dr. Rajiv Shah, was astounded by what South Korea was able to do. 
they had just deployed an army of community health personnel who were spraying Purell on, on people going in and out of the subway, who were wiping down public spaces and contact points, who were making uh, drive-through testing available uh, very broadly by doing swab collections and mailing it into a public health laboratory construct where uh, and reference labs that can validate the data quickly. They thought everything was under control. South Korea appears to be flattening the curve. South Korea has done better than most of the other countries around the world. They had found only 30 cases. The lowest number of new cases. A leader in the global fight against the new coronavirus. Something they're doing is working. So we should Then on February 18th, they identified a 61-year-old woman in Daegu, South Korea. At the time, they had discovered no other cases in Daegu. But when they traced her contacts, it led them here. The Shincheonji Church, a Christian sect that claims over 200,000 members who believe that their leader, this man, is the Messiah. Officials knew they had a big problem. It became obvious that this was a cluster that was at risk, and then we decided to trace the group as a whole. And this is about 9,000, 10,000 people. So you tested 9,000 members of the church? Not all of them, but we contacted them to the extent that they were traceable asked if they had any symptoms. The percentage of positives among them were much higher than any other groups. Health officials found that thousands of church members were positive and they were quarantined. Dozens would die. Today, South Korea, along with Japan, Taiwan, and Vietnam, has managed to control the spread of the virus better than most countries. In Seoul, a crowded city of 10 million people, there have been just four known deaths. In the country of South Korea, how many deaths approximately? It would be 260, 264. The number has now crept up to around 300. By mid-January, the CDC was busy developing its own diagnostic test. Good morning, everyone. And On January 28th, Secretary Azar announced they were ready to go. CDC, this is really a historic accomplishment. Within one week, within one week, the CDC had invented a rapid diagnostic test. Within weeks... Right out of the gate, I was feeling really good about the process. Scott Becker is the CEO of the Association of Public Health Labs. We were going to be able to cover the country to a good extent for the surveillance and early detection that was really job one. But that optimism evaporated by the end of the first week in February. It was Sunday morning, February 8th. I woke up a little bit late. I read my texts and my emails, and I start seeing these messages. We're having a problem. Is anyone else seeing this? I call that an OSM. It was my own moment. And I remember thinking, oh my God, wait till governors and others find out about this. We're all counting on getting testing up and running. and. What a nightmare this is going to be. So it was pretty devastating to everyone, the CDC staff, to public health labs, to epidemiologists, the public health community. You know, we were left without the biggest tool in our toolbox. Government officials discovered contamination in a CDC lab in Atlanta. By the then, a diagnostic test developed by German scientists was available from the WHO. But U.S. officials would insist it was better to find an American solution. Any of these groups can submit their testing kits through our regulatory processes. But without that and without a plan, we are not going to accept tests that have not been studied by us. Good answer. 
It's a good answer. Is that excusable that they failed to have a test ready to go? That's inexcusable in my book. I mean, how can you distribute something that is so critical to monitor the epidemic and, and have it be faulty? We cannot distribute drugs like that. We cannot distribute the other FDA-approved tests uh, in that fashion. So that's certainly inexcusable, and it, it set us back uh, for a good month, I would say. Is it unusual to have a glitch in the initial tests? I have not seen another mistake like this at CDC. The tests have rolled out very effectively uh, without a glitch in the past. So Tom Frieden was head of the CDC during the Obama administration. Is there any bigger misstep or stumble here than the failure to test? I think when we look back at what went right and what went wrong, we're going to focus on February. What should have gotten done in February that didn't happen? So my first question to you is, uh, does the CDC's test for coronavirus work? Yeah, the problem was in when the test was sent to the states, one of the components had a contaminant in it. That's what I asked Dr. Redfield why South CDC Korea succeeded, where the U.S. failed. Korea had already developed private-public partnerships through the MERS thing and really had invested enormously appropriately. And that's what our nation had not done over the last 30 years. So you won't get an argument from me that the public health workforce has been really underinvested in for decades. The CDC says it's now going to send improved tests to the labs facing problems. Experts Weeks say were lost while the CDC remanufactured the tests. If the failure at the CDC and the outbreaks in China and South Korea did not instill more urgency, the February outbreak in Iran should have. This is Qom, a place of pilgrimage for Shiite Muslims from all over the world, including China. It was here that the world's next major outbreak of the virus erupted. From the beginning, Iran's leaders, like America's, played down the dangers. A mixture of religion and national pride had delayed Iran's response. Iran would soon be reporting the world's highest mortality rate. We never thought Iran would be one of the first countries hit uh, by the pandemic. For, for whatever reason, uh, because of our contacts or because of other reasons, we were one of the first countries hit. I was able to reach Iran's foreign minister, Javad Zarif, in Tehran. It was 6 o'clock in the morning, my time. Why do you think you were so hard hit? What, what are the theories now? Well, nobody knows. I mean, uh, it was at a time when uh, more than anything, the population was unprepared. In fact, it was natural that Iran would be hit with a virus from China. It is not only that Chinese pilgrims come here. Iran faces tough U.S. economic sanctions. And as a result, China has become Iran's lifeline to the outside world. Kamyar Alai is an Iranian healthcare expert living in exile in the U.S. And there are a lot of you know, Chinese investors in Iran. So they have sent some of the employees to work in Iran. So that was due to Chinese New Year. They went back to China, got infected, brought back to Iran. And we asked the government you know, to, to cancel the direct flights from China to Iran. But due to political interests, the Iranian government, they decided not to do that. The flights were on Iran's largest carrier, Mahan Air. But Zarif told me that Iran canceled its flights from China at the same time as America did. I think we were one of the first uh, to limit flights uh, and to screen uh, passengers. The Americans cut flights to, from China at the end of January. My information uh, is that our decision was made basically in the same time zone as the others. Yet one analysis of flight records shows that Mahan Air flew over 55 round-trip flights to and from China between February 5th 
and February 23rd. They flew on to Iraq, Syria, Turkey, Lebanon, and other countries. All the while, Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, would continue to downplay the virus. At one point, he said it was possibly a biological attack. Do you agree with the Supreme Leader that the coronavirus was perhaps a biological attack by the United States upon Iran? Well, there are a lot of speculations on all sides about this. I said it's not unreasonable to believe that. Talk of a biological attack was a distraction. Tehran's hospitals were overwhelmed. On social media, people were seen collapsing in the streets. The government also delayed the closing of parliament. At least 23 senior government figures caught the coronavirus. Reportedly, around a dozen senior officials died. Iraj Harirchi, the deputy health minister, appeared at this press conference clearly ill while denying he had the coronavirus. And he said, no, this is just, you know, come on cold, it's not a serious thing. The next day, however, he tested positive and was hospitalized. Many of Iran's faithful continued to deny the seriousness of the situation. <laughs> It wasn't until March 16th that the government closed Qom's shrines. It took some time for us to close the shrines. Uh, it, we have a very traditional society with people who still do not agree with us. By then, government officials had begun enforcing social distancing and stay-at-home orders. But it was too late. Today, Iran has reported over 180,000 cases and 9,000 deaths. Coronavirus should have been no surprise. The world has seen an increasing number of viral outbreaks in recent years. Health official tells us that there may already be hundreds more fatalities than have been reported. In 2014, the deadly Ebola epidemic was a big wake-up call. This is a, an epidemic of dysfunctional health systems. Jeremy Conandike led the U.S. government's effort to fight it. It was a monumental effort to bring that outbreak under control. I think all of us who were involved in that effort looked back at that and said, wow, a truly airborne or droplet style respiratory pandemic is going to be so much worse and so much more difficult. And so there was a real urgency in the final years of the Obama administration to begin laying more groundwork for that kind of a scenario. To address potential threats like this, the Obama White House organized a pandemic response team inside the National Security Council, the NSC. Place an infrastructure so that if and when a new strain of flu, like the Spanish flu, crops up five years from now or a decade from now, we've made the investment. But in 2018, 
after Trump tapped John Bolton to head the NSC, the pandemic response team was reorganized. Its members were reassigned. Its leader, Admiral Timothy Ziemer, left. Bolton has maintained that he was simply streamlining bloated NSC operations and that it did not hurt America's pandemic response. But last year, Stephen Morrison headed a bipartisan effort to address America's pandemic response capacity. His report, released in November 2019, recommended the pandemic response team be moved back to the White House. We live in an era in which we're seeing increasing rapidity and increasing velocity and increasing impacts of these new pathogens coming at us. This is the condition of our microbial universe today. SARS-like virus has now spread into Japan. More than 10,000 people died from H1N1. The idea that you would disband your capacity willfully at the White House, aware of the developments of the last two decades, which were convincingly that we needed to be prepared and far better prepared on a consistent and sustained and coherent basis. What's the explanation that would be given? Well, I can't speak for John Bolton. I presume that they wanted to see that responsibility moved over out of the White House to the secretary of HHS and to those who worked underneath him. So what's wrong with that decision to move this capacity over to the HHS? The mistake there is to assume that the secretary of HHS is able to um, see the full picture and be able to command the different elements of our government to respond in a coordinated and coherent and integrated way, um, that can only happen uh, through an empowered entity at the White House. So by definition, we set ourselves up for a slow and sluggish response, a slow, sluggish and halting response. The virus was about to slam into Europe. On February 19th, a championship soccer match was set to kick off in Italy's largest stadium. Capacity, 75,000. The Atalanta team from Bergamo in Lombardy won the game. Afterwards, Bergamo became the epicenter of Italy's outbreak. And they are in dream. Dr. Stefano Fagioli of Bergamo remembers. May had 10 colleagues from our hospital, which went to see the game, and 10 of them, they all got infected. Oh, my God. When I spoke to Dr. Fagioli, he was quarantined at home after catching the virus himself. And it's interesting that the two main outbreaks in Spain are close to Madrid and Valencia, which was the other, the opponent team. In the beginning, Italy, like China and Iran, was slow to react. Dr. Marco Vergano is an anesthesiologist in Turin. We, we were conducting really uh, a, a, the usual, a normal life, a social life in the last week of February. It, and it's really difficult to implement uh, social distancing measures uh, when you uh, don't have your hospitals already overwhelmed by patients. But they were losing valuable time. Flights were cut from China, but as in the US, Italy hesitated to do more. The job was left up to town mayors. Mandiamo i carabinieri, ma li mandiamo con i lanciafiamme. Ste cazzo di parrucchiere che vanno in casa a giustare i capelli e feb. A che cazzo servono? Chi cazzo da da vedere per sti capelli aggiustati in dota vut? They became viral uh, on social media. People, I think, uh, realized quite soon that. Uh, uh, this was a way to protect them and protect uh, others. Probably this happened uh, maybe a couple of weeks later than, uh, 
than was necessary. Because w what we know is that if you implement some uh, real uh, stringent social distancing measures uh, uh, at the beginning of the surge, and since this is an exponential surge, uh, just uh, maybe 24 or 48 hours earlier uh, is enough uh, to avoid uh, more than 30 or 40 percent uh, of the number of infected people uh, three weeks later. The closing of flights from China had done little to stem the spread. In January, the government of Italy was celebrating a new initiative to increase Chinese tourism. Two Chinese tourists from Wuhan arrived in Milan on January 23rd. They tested positive a week later. The virus was already here. Italy's surge in cases now marks the biggest coronavirus outbreak outside of Asia. The death toll leaping by more than 50 percent in one day. Italy is the hardest hit country in Europe with more than 7,300 reported infections. Was there a moment in time when this really seized your attention? In, in my case, personally, it, it was that Skype call from the task force in Lombardia, from this friend of mine. He told me I have seen scenes in hospitals that I will never forget in my whole life. He described as uh, hospitals uh, with uh, people in hallways and people uh, dying outside of hospitals because uh, even uh, uh, there were not enough uh, ambulances uh, or ambulances were in a queue outside uh, of the hospitals. Hospitals in Italy's north were overwhelmed. There were not enough beds, let alone ventilators. In, in a condition with a severe sh shortage of resources, uh, and maybe you have uh, 10 people in need of a ventilator and, and only one or two ventilators available. And they need to be used by uh, younger people that have a greater chance of survival, right? Yeah. The government did not order a nationwide lockdown until March 9th. To date, over 34,000 Italians have died of COVID-19. Seeing what was happening around the world, top American public health officials were increasingly convinced that halting flights from China was not enough. I think most health officials agree that, at best, it delays and, as the secretary says, kind of pauses things. Dr. Fauci and two other officials plan to confront the president on February 26th. A broad pandemic throughout the world, travel restrictions are not going to help. You can't just travel restrict everyone. The public health officials, Redfield, Anthony Fauci at the NIH, Stephen Hahn at FDA, they had all decided that was going to be the day they were going to tell the president, hey, look, we need to we need to be more aggressive here. But before they could do that, Dr. Nancy Messonnier, a top CDC official, spoke out publicly. Tonight, the CDC is calling the coronavirus a tremendous health threat. We are working to ready our public health workforce to respond to local cases and the possibility this outbreak could become a pandemic. It was a dire warning. The virus has killed more than 2,200 people and infected nearly 77,000 worldwide. The president was on his way to India. Thank you, Mr. President. There, he was reassuring. You may ask about the uh, coronavirus, which is uh, very well under control in our country. We uh, have very few people with it. But as he prepared to return home, Messonnier spoke to reporters again. Ultimately, we expect we will see community spread in this country. It's not so much a question of if this will happen anymore, but rather more of a question of exactly when this will happen and how many people in this country will have severe illness. Federal health officials said today the coronavirus will certainly begin spreading. It is not a question of if, but when. As Nancy Messonnier is giving this briefing to reporters, the president is just getting on Air Force One in India to fly home. 
So as he's flying home, the stock market crashes a thousand points. Wall Street continues to sell on those coronavirus fears, the Dow falling close to 900 points today. TV is broadcasting nonstop about how this is going to change the way Americans live. And of course, the president hadn't been briefed on any of this. So by the time Air Force One lands uh, Wednesday morning on the 26th, he's fuming, he's angry. The, the big economic success that he's constantly touting is under assault from his viewpoint. He picks up the phone and calls Azar, yells at Azar, says, you're scaring people to death here, what's going on? But the, but the big consequence of, of that is that the briefing that the public health officials had intended to do for Trump that evening after he'd returned, that briefing never happens. Angry with his public health advisors, Trump refused to meet with them. Talk of more aggressive measures such as stay-at-home orders and strict social distancing was put off. Messonnier's warnings were heresy. They then, the next day, dedicated an entire presidential press conference to walking back the, the warning and the assessment that she had given. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. And with the benefit of a month's hindsight, she was 100 percent right. She accurately anticipated what was about to happen. She tried to warn the country of that. And uh, the White House tried to furiously walk it back. The CDC said yesterday that they believe it's inevitable that the virus will spread in the United States, and it's not a question of if, but when. Do you agree with that assessment? Well, I don't think it's inevitable. It probably will. It possibly will. It could be at a very small level or it could be at a larger level. What, whatever happens, we're totally prepared. We have the best people in the world. As someone who served in government, I can tell you that kind of behavior sends a very, very clear signal to government workers about what is and is not permissible to say. It's interesting that it's very much like what happened in China in late December and early January. The parallels are very, are very striking. I, I think it's immensely irresponsible of people in this administration to be blaming China for that kind of behavior, even as they have engaged in it themselves. Dr. Nancy Messonnier would be sidelined. Alex Azar was removed as head of the task force. He was replaced by Vice President Pence. Mike is going to be in charge, and Mike will report back to me. But he's got a certain talent for this, and uh, I'm going to ask Mike Pence to say a few words, please. Thank you, Mike. What talent Vice President Pence was bringing was not clear. Thank you, Mr. President. When he was governor of Indiana, he had slashed the state's public health budget as a staunch evangelical Christian, he had questioned scientific advice. You don't so, feel like you're being replaced. Not in the least. I'm, I, I, no. when, the, when, when this was mentioned to me, I, said, I was delighted that I get to have the vice president helping in this way. Delighted. Absolutely. The daily press briefings became a platform for the president's positive messaging. You are hearing the line that the risk for Americans is low, which comes from everybody's mouth, from the president on down. Mr. President, to follow up, how should Americans prepare for this virus? Should they go on with their daily lives, change their routine? What should what should they do? Well, I hope they don't change their routine, but maybe Anthony, I'll let you uh, I'll let you answer that. Or Bob, do you want to answer that? Sure, sure, Mr. President. Thank you. I think it's really important that, as I said, the risk at this time is low. The American public needs to go on with their normal lives. Okay. You said, February 29th, the risk at this time is low. The American public needs to go on with their normal lives. It was true at that time, Martin. I think the risk was low. But by this time, China had had an outbreak. I Iran was in the midst of a, a major outbreak, as was Italy. And you're saying, at this time, the risk is low. Yeah, well, the risk was low to the general American public at the time. But the fact is that we had stumbled in February to test adequately, to test enough people to know where things were going. How can you say that when we had such inadequate testing? Well, the purpose, I'm sure, of your documentary is to help identify lessons and correct them so we don't repeat this. Many of us are in the arena where, as Teddy Roosevelt would say, we're marred and bloodied. Uh, we're trying to dare greatly. Hopefully, at best, we'll know the triumph of high achievement. And, you know, at worst, we'll fail by daring greatly. 
Throughout February, the president had continued to hold his rallies. Hello, Phoenix. Hello, Las Vegas. Great to be with you. Where else would you like to be but a Trump rally, right? He blamed others for exaggerating the threat. Now the Democrats are politicizing the coronavirus. You know that, right? Coronavirus. They are politicizing it. And this is their new hoax. The president would not you know, call for social distancing for another two and a half weeks. We have leaders throughout much of January and February saying that this is a hoax. 35,000 people on average die each year from the flu. Did anyone know that? 35,000. And so far, we have lost nobody to coronavirus in the United States. It's a complete denial of, uh, of science and uh, leading to all sorts of decisions that are harmful to our country, to our planet. You're quoting the president. He made these comments. Is it your view that he knew better than that? Or was he simply misinformed? I cannot psychoanalyze the president. But we know that he, he has a tendency to, be, to believe he's the best at everything. And he probably thinks he's better than the scientists. And you wonder the press is in hysteria mode. Fake news and the camera just went off. I think if he were practicing medicine, uh, he would be negligent and he would be prosecuted. The president's behavior, the president's resort to repeated falsehoods is a function of the way he is approaching this crisis. He's approaching this crisis about how it affects his own political survivability and re-electability. Uh, this is a list of uh, the different countries. The United States is rated number one, most prepared. I would equate it to something like seeing a hurricane offshore that has just taken out a couple of Caribbean islands and is strengthening to Category 5 as it heads for Florida, and not bothering to tell people to get off the beach and board their windows and only starting to do that when you see the storm surge coming ashore, by which point it's, of course, far too late. The first COVID-19 death to be recognized in America was on February 29th, near Seattle. It was followed by a cluster of cases in a nursing home. But the big bomb would land on New York City. From the suburb of New Rochelle, 20 miles north of the city, an estate lawyer commuted daily by train into his office in Midtown Manhattan. In late February, he started feeling sick. On February 27th, he checked himself into a New York Presbyterian hospital in Bronxville, New York. Lawrence Garbus tested positive on March 2nd. The man in his 50s lives in Westchester, but works in Manhattan. New York City Health Department says he is in severe condition. Now the entire family in quarantine. For Dr. Griffin, who had been seeing patients with COVID-like symptoms since mid-February, the Garbus case confirmed what he had suspected all along. Um, this gentleman had not traveled, so he had obviously acquired it in the New York area. Dr. Griffin had been pressing for more testing for weeks. Mm -hmm. But because of a lack of testing capacity, he says, the CDC told him he could only test Garbus's immediate contacts. You too. Bye. So our impression at this point in the end of February, beginning of March, is that we already had community transmission of COVID-19 in the New York area. But you're only letting us test people that have had contact with this man we don't think he got it in New Rochelle. We suspect he got it commuting to and from the city. We would like to start testing all these people with respiratory symptoms that we don't have a diagnosis for. What's their response? We still have our rigid criteria. Um, unless someone is really severely ill, they need to have a direct contact or a travel history. And what's your response to them? Our response is we think this gentleman got it in the community. We think there's community spread, and we would like to do broader testing. But you're not allowed to. We're not allowed to.
Jessica Caro is a nurse who works at a New York Presbyterian clinic. We first heard the news of the lawyer from New Rochelle getting sick, and that scared me because I live like maybe 10 minute drive away from there. Her 16-year-old daughter, Gianna, was the first one in her family to get sick. She was complaining to me that she had a fever, and, you know, nurse mom was just, like, throwing her some Motrin and say, you know, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. And I finally got a thermometer on her when I almost dropped it because it was 105. Not 100.5, it was 105. Wanting to get her daughter tested, Jessica called New York's COVID hotline. Thank you for calling the New York State COVID-19 hotline. Eventually, she got a live person on the line, but it didn't help. This man was like, has your daughter traveled to China? And I'm like, no. He's like, well, has she had contact with somebody that's positive? I'm like, well, we don't know. And the last question was, is she short of breath? And I'm like, well, not currently, but she's very sick. And the man tells me, well, if she's not short of breath, she doesn't qualify. I remember hanging up the phone and just like this, the, I could feel the heat coming off of me, just how angry I was. There was a shortage of tests across America. Dr. Susan Butler Wu runs a clinical microbiology lab in Los Angeles. Testing was very restricted. You have to get approval from your local public health authority in order to be able to do that testing. And they then had to coordinate with the CDC to get approval to do the testing. So it was a very arduous process. Because of shortages, the CDC limited who qualified for a test. At one point, testing was limited to people coming in from mainland China. But viruses don't respect borders. They don't respect anything like that. And so I think we were always way behind um, because of that. It wasn't probably until later in January, February, that I really started to feel like even if the public health labs were able to offer this testing, it's just not sufficient. We're not going to be able to respond to something of this magnitude. I've talked to a number of doctors, and they say, look, if I couldn't tell them that my patient had been to uh, China, they couldn't get a test. Yeah, that's a decision that's made individually by each health department, how they wanted to do that. I will say that early on in January and February, the cases that were recognized in the United States were largely linked to uh, Wuhan, China. And so those were the case criteria as this new epidemic happened. By early March, the CDC allowed for more people to get tests, but shortages persisted, though not for celebrities. That Kevin Durant has been tested positive for the coronavirus. On this social year. media, criticism for celebrities who've been tested, like Celine Dion, Heidi Klum, and reportedly Chris Jenner. Whatever it may be, I'm going to quarantine myself. How are non symptomatic professional athletes getting tests while others are waiting in line? In Can we see stars being able to be tested where people without means or without celebrity status are unable to get tested? Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of issues um, with regard to inequity in our society have really come out. But I think that people get a little bit intolerant when it's actually affecting um, the health of them, their loved ones, their children, when they realize that, you know, you're concerned about your mother, she can't get tested, um, but a VIP can get tested. And I think that during a pandemic, um, there's something quite wrong with, with that occurring. Our response is among the very worst in the world, certainly among all the major countries. Um, By the end of the first week in March, there were 337 cases of COVID-19 in the U.S. and 17 deaths. But cases were doubling every several days, and only around 4,000 people had been tested. When the president visited the CDC on March 6th, he flatly denied there was a shortage. Anybody right now and yesterday, anybody that needs a test gets a test. We, they're there. They have the test. And the tests are beautiful. You know, March 6th is the date that you won't forget, where the president came to the CDC. He's wearing the hat, Make America Great Again. And he states that everyone who wants a test can get a test. Did he believe that, do you think? 
Again, I don't, I'm not going to comment on what I think the president believed or didn't believe. Did you talk to him? Did you say to him, look, Mr. President, uh, w with all due respect, it's not true what you're saying? Yeah, I'm not going to comment on the conversations I've had with the president. If there's a doctor that wants to test, if there's somebody coming off a ship, they're all set. They have around here. I remember watching that and thinking I'd like the ability to test patients in my hospital at a much larger scale than what I'm doing and I know I can't do that either. So at the time it didn't reflect the reality of what I was experiencing as a clinical laboratory director in a hospital. Not at all. And the tests are all perfect. Like the letter was perfect. The transcription was perfect. Right? It was a made-for-TV event um, and it was sound bites. But the reality of the situation was quite different, and I think most Americans knew that at the time. The president had to have known. I would expect that he did. But even had there been enough tests, the U.S. was facing a shortage of nasal swabs, masks, and other equipment needed to carry out the tests. And the president placed responsibility on state and local authorities to acquire their own supplies. Respirators ventilators, all of the equipment, try getting it yourself. We will be backing you, but try getting it yourself. When he yourself. says things like the governors in the states should be trying to look after their own needs and, and get these things themselves, what that means is there is no single picture of what the country needs. So you're on your own, boys and girls. You're on your own, but we're also going to be buying up all the supplies that we've told you you need. Every state is basically going on eBay and bidding against all the others and against the federal government to try and get the basic supplies that they need. By March 11th, there were 1,300 cases in the U.S. and 36 deaths. It was then that President Trump decided to expand his travel ban to European countries. My fellow Americans, to keep new cases from entering our shores, we will be suspending all travel from Europe to the United States for the next 30 days. The next day, Dr. Fauci testified before Congress and admitted they were still failing to test adequately. The system is not really geared to what we need right now, what you are asking for. That is a failing. And a that, failing, yes. It, it is a failing. I mean, let's admit it. He was spot on, and I'm glad he said it. Somebody had to say it. The way people in other countries are doing it, we're not set up for that. I concur with Dr. Fauci. We've completely failed. This is a, this is a massive failure. But at the end of the day, the whole way that healthcare is set up in this country is the failure too, right? That every lab is fighting for itself, every state is fighting for itself, every city is fighting for itself. I mean, that's not what you need in something like this. Is it possible that your impulse to put a positive spin on things may be giving Americans a false sense of hope? No, I don't think so. The preparedness so. right now. No, I don't think so. I think that, uh, I think it's got, sale, no, no, The not yet approved drug. I mean, such a lovely question. Um, what do you say the Americans were scared though? I guess nearly 200 dead, 14,000 who are sick, millions, as you witnessed, who are scared right now. What do you say to Americans who are watching you right now who are scared? I say that you're a terrible reporter. That's what I say. Go ahead. I think it's a very nasty question, and I think it's a very bad signal that you're putting out to the American people. The American people are looking for answers, and they're looking for hope. And you're doing sensationalism. By the end of March, there were more than 5,500 deaths. Jessica Carroll, the clinic nurse, was never able to get her daughter Gianna tested. Fortunately, Gianna recovered. But two weeks later, Jessica's aunt Amelia spiked a high fever and cough. I get a phone call from my mom that my aunt is ill. And that's when I started to get really scared because you kept hearing the hospitals filling up and now I'm like, wait, this is, this is not good. Amelia was hospitalized, but in the meantime, Jessica got another call. It was her mother. She said, I have to tell you something. She said, I have a fever. And I said, no, mommy, please don't tell me that. And she goes, yeah, I have a fever. And I started coughing and I'm scared. Jessica's mother was hospitalized on April 7th. The next day, just down the hospital hallway, her sister Amelia, 
Jessica's aunt died. By now, there were over 18,000 deaths from coronavirus in America. The one time that I spoke to her on the phone, she was very out of breath. Every word was labored. Um, and so we, at that point, were just conversing by text. But then I, I had texted her at some point in the evening, and she hadn't answered me back. And I'm like now starting getting worried, and next thing you know, I get a text from her. It was like jarbled gibberish, and then it was, call me, call me now. And um, the doctor was there, and the doctor is telling me, um, you know, unfortunately at this point, we need to intubate. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it, thank you so much. Since visiting was prohibited, Jessica could only reach her mother through FaceTime. Hi, Mommy. Hi, Mama, do you hear me? In my heart, I know she was able to hear me, but it was hard to see her like that. I even promised her that when she got better, I'd take her to her favorite place, which is the casino. And um, not being able to um, be there and hold her hand and let her hear my voice has just been the worst of all of this. Mama, I love you. I love you so much. You're so strong and you're fighting. I know you are. <laughs> After 16 days on a ventilator, Jessica's mother, Ann Martinez, passed away. It happened on April 23rd. It was her 80th birthday. By then, over 50,000 Americans had died, around 15,000 of them in New York State. The bodies were stored in refrigerated trucks next to the hospitals. When we interviewed Dr. Ho on March 31st, he described New York this way. New York is the new Wuhan right now. There's tremendous carnage seen in all the hospitals uh, in this area. They're scared. They're overwhelmed. It's like being hit by a tsunami. Of, of patients, and they're not well equipped to fight this. Who do you blame for this? I blame the government. I honestly, I blame the government for um, not alerting us sooner that this was going to be an issue, not um, consolidating a nationwide stockpile, and not putting people in charge of uh, giving it to who needs it in an orderly fashion. Just being a citizen, not even being a healthcare professional and watching the news, I can see how just incompetent everything is. Jessica Caro's mother and aunt immigrated here from the Dominican Republic. Black and Latino communities have been the hardest hit. Blacks and Latinos are grossly disproportionately killed by Cleavon Gilman is an emergency room doctor at New York Presbyterian. That's just due to that a large majority of us live in housing projects as well. Uh, a lot of us are also essential workers, um, MTA officers, grocery clerks, um, and that's just taking a toll on our whole community. Across the city, the virus has been twice as deadly for blacks and Latinos as whites. And poverty is also a dangerous risk factor. I think this crisis has amassed a tremendous vulnerability in America, where 40, 50, 60 percent of American households barely get by day to day, have lost faith in the American dream for their children, that their kids can do better, that they can. And, and now our society will have to grapple with and deal with the reality that we can't just hide and pretend that's not the case anymore. Today, the total number of Americans who have died is more than 115,000. A Columbia University study has calculated that had a stay-at-home order been imposed at the end of February, it would have prevented 83% of all U.S. deaths. 
It's remarkable to me that in the Vietnam War, I think 55,000 American soldiers died. And we're now saying we might see four times that many people die. Yep. It's, it's astounding. You know, 9-11, we lost 3,000 people. And in response to that, the country built an infrastructure for protecting against terrorist attacks that costs an average of 150 to $250 billion a year. I think we need to take this threat as seriously as we take the threat of terrorism. Um, it has the potential to kill at least as many, if not considerably more Americans. And I hope coming out of this, whenever we do eventually come out of this, we'll finally take seriously the importance of health security and public health investments. Finally, there was the toll on healthcare workers. In New York, scores of healthcare workers died of the virus. New Yorkers tried to show their support. Every day, thousands went to the streets and to their windows to say thank you. while the number of bodies overwhelmed the city. Trucks made their daily runs to a potter's field where the poorest among us are laid to rest. Worldwide, the virus has killed more than 430,000 people. In the U.S., a nationwide lockdown has led to the steepest drop in employment since the Great Depression. Now, countries around the world are beginning to reopen. Healthcare officials warn of a second wave. For more on this and other Frontline programs, visit our website at pbs.org slash frontline. Frontline, the virus, what went wrong, is available on Amazon Prime Video.